Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my first uh, AM reading update of February 2018. I'm going to try and make this uh, quick because uh, perhaps as a metaphor for my anxiety about the month, I might have bit off a bit more than I could chew for my time constraints. <laughs> I have a large uh, TBR for February, and uh, <laughs> and I really should be getting to bed uh, soon, so I will stop uh, rambling and get to the point of recapping my reading. <laughs> to start with, I finished Beneath the Haunting Sea by Joanna Ruth Meyer. This is a YA epic fantasy novel by a woman who I know somewhat through a NaNoWriMo Vidler community uh, several years back. We commented on each other's stuff a little bit, uh, <laughs> but uh, mostly I'd been following her uh, progress ever since because I was so impressed by her uh, drive to succeed and intrigued by what she talked about in her videos, and lo and behold, here's her debut novel, and uh, I think it was really good, and um, I don't think it's much talked about in the YA community because I believe she's relatively unknown. Um, and so I'm glad to give it as much of a shout out as I can on booktube to hopefully bring a little bit of attention to it. This is the story of Talia, who is a young woman who um, is about to inherit a uh, large kingdom, but then she is uh, deposed by a rival and she and her mother are sent across the sea and suddenly swept up into this mythological uh, plot that uh, she sort of has to unravel and understand her broader destiny. and. Um, I think Meyer does a great job in incorporating mythology and making all of her characters and her uh, fantastical godly characters uh, seem uh, well fleshed out and intriguing. I do think there's a little bit of a uh, romantic uh, subplot, as it were, you know, something to keep the plot going as we're slowly picking up clues about the mythology, and I don't think the romantic uh, plot works as well. It made me... Uh, raise my eyebrow a bit about uh, why this uh, character, why Talia, would uh, be getting so into that uh, given everything else uh, going on in her life. But overall I was uh, very engrossed and I think one of the weaknesses I found in this book is that uh, the world building was so intriguing about uh, the entire uh, society that Meyer built up that I wanted to know more about uh, the empire and the divisions between countries and so forth and we dealt uh, with the mythology of the place but uh, but not with other things but that was fine because it was uh, very intriguing and uh, I love uh, YA fantasy and, and regular fantasy that delves into uh, the mythology of, uh, of a place and of how the gods are created and understood through these stories and uh, Again, I thought she did a good job at uh, incorporating these sort of larger-than-life myths to make everything really pop. So, yeah, definitely recommend this one. And finally, this feels like a bit of a relief after talking about this book uh, for a full month. I finished uh, The Best American Short Stories of 2017 as uh, guest edited by Meg Wallitzer. Um, I thought it particularly ended on a high note. Uh, the final story is called A Famous Actor by Jess Walter. And it's about a famous actor who, uh, while filming on location, sleeps with a townie, <laughs> as it were. But uh, you don't know anybody's name in all of this, and uh, so it's kind of archetypal and uh, comedic, but also I think kind of uh, surprisingly deep about uh, relationships and how people connect to one another. Uh, really told much more from the perspective of uh, the, the woman who's being slept with <laughs> than the uh, famous actor. And uh, I, I really appreciated it. Overall, I don't know if this is my favorite uh, collection. It's not as cohesive as I think I remember the last collection uh, from 2016. Uh, and I guess it kind of bummed me out because I love Meg Wallitzer so much as an author. But, uh, I, oh, but I do think um, when I was writing my review, I did have a lot of stories that I ended up uh, noting that I really liked, so I have not much room to complain. <laughs> so it was good. good. It was a good collection of short stories, as always. <laughs> this is my first uh, read book of February. This is Sonora by Hannah Lilith Asadi. I got this signed um, last year at the Gaithersburg Book Festival. I think this might be one of my favorite signatures of all time. Uh, just. Uh, given the uniqueness of what she wrote. Sonora is a slight novel about uh, the friendship between these two girls who grew up in the Arizona desert 
and both of them are sort of uh, between worlds um, in their backgrounds. Uh, our main character, Ahlam, is the daughter of a Palestinian refugee and his Israeli wife, and uh, they spend a lot of their time in the background sort of in a state of flux about uh, that and about what's going on back home. And then her friend Laura is the daughter of a Native American woman and a white man. And uh, her mother, who I think was accused of being a witch, um, died when she was young. Both of these girls are very ostracized at school, so they uh, end up uh, becoming friends. And that friendship, I think, is fortified when a series of uh, surprising suicides happen in their high school that they're somewhat connected with, with their sexual awakening of the time, um, and then they end up moving to New York to pursue their dreams and get lost in that culture. This is a very uh, lyrical novel. Asadi is a poet, and uh, it's just um, sort of grounded in that. There's not a lot of uh, specific um, prosaic writing. It's um, just sort of washes over you in waves. I just emotions and uh, descriptions of uh, setting. I just uh, found it very moving and um, it's garnered a lot of tension, attention in the uh, in awards circuits it seems and I can understand why. There's a uniqueness to uh, how Asadi um, goes into this relationship and into the longing of these girls to find themselves and the broader themes of uh, sort of being displaced in the world and then I just started this novel as part of my Finish My Virginia Woolf Novels uh, initiative of February, which I may or may not uh, achieve. <laughs> this is um, the first novel of Woolf's uh, published that I had yet to read. It was published in uh, 1919. It's night and day. I really just started it, so I can't say much about it. I'll read from the back. Uh, Virginia Woolf's second novel, Night and Day, revolves around the romances of a handful of young people in pre-World War I London, following them through a maze of misunderstandings as they work their way toward compatibility and love. The wealthy heroine, Catherine Hilbury, is engaged to William Rodney, a government clerk, though she inwardly rebels against the stifling effects of domestic life. Ralph Denham, a lawyer from an inferior social background, tempts her with a less compromising relationship. He, in turn, is loved by Mary Datchett, a woman who, unlike Catherine, chooses to liberate her sex through social reform. Although the book is at its heart a love story, it transcends conventional romance to pose crucial questions about women, intellectual freedom, and marriage. So, yeah, uh, I feel a bit rusty on Wolf, and uh, this uh, novel is particularly long. It's over 500 pages, so I'm not sure how quickly I will be completing this and keeping on my schedule, but I'm going to try to put that on the back burner and uh, prioritize getting the most out of this book as I can, hopefully, because uh, that's the way to do it. <laughs> and finally, I think I'm going to end with my first page 112 tag. I talked about it a bit in my uh, book haul from January that um, the page 112 tag was started by Sean the Book Maniac and uh, generally speaking it's about re reading page 112 from different novels and uh, assessing critically which ones uh, work and which don't just given the writing on that one page and nothing else about the book and so I decided to tackle my uh, intimidating Goodreads TBR and the titles that I've had on it for a few years now and pit two books against each other and decide on page 112 which one I will continue with. So I'm starting with page 112 with All I Love and Know by Judith Frank. <clears throat> if he had extended his hand, Matt would have gripped it with all of his might, but he was spared that display because all he got was a curt nod. When Yo-Yo barged at him, Yossi quieted him by taking his head into his two large hands. Don't mind him, Matt said, taking note of his wedding band. He's a goof. I don't, Yossi said. Matt got him coffee, which he drank black, and as they sat down at the kitchen table, Yossi asked him in a nonplussed way why he wanted to learn Hebrew. Are you Jewish? he asked. Matt felt himself bristle. As happened with some straight men, Yossi made him feel girly and silly. No, I'm not, he replied, but my partner is. He cleared his throat and gazed at the man across the table from him as he digested the word partner 
enjoying for once the anticipation of telling their story, knowing that it would wipe the dismissive look off of Yossi's handsome face. My partner, his name is Daniel. Daniel's brother and sister-in-law were killed in a pagua in Jerusalem, and there's a chance that we are going to raise the children. Yossi sat back in his chair and placed his hand on his chest. Ah, he said gently, how old are they? Gal is six and Noam is eleven months. Yossi heaved a sigh. Terrible. It was the Pegua at Peace Train Cafe? Matt nodded. So your first Hebrew word is Pegua. It hadn't been, quite, but Matt didn't correct him. Yossi was so obviously touched by the thought, and it felt delightful to have this Israeli warrior fearing, feeling bad for him. Yes, and the word Pitsatsa, Matt said, bringing out the Hebrew word for bomb and then thinking that he was perhaps working the path that was too hard. But that's about it. Oh, and Buba and Miskena, things like that. Yossi smiled faintly. Miskena, is there a word in English? I don't think so. Poor thing? Yossi shrugged. Miskena, that's for a girl. You must also learn the word for a boy poor thing. Miskin. <laughs> I think that page uh, betrayed my own faults with uh, the page 112 tag because I probably shouldn't know much about the book, but I do know that uh, I think a lot of the uh, back summary of the book is um, implied in that uh, page. Um, Matt is a non-Jew talking with an Israeli man. Matt is in a gay relationship and his uh, lover, who is Jewish and he is not, uh, his uh, family just died in a uh, terrorist attack at Pegua in, in Israel, and uh, they are looking to take care of the children. <laughs> that is all explained, I think, on the back and in that one page. Um, I think the, the conversation flows really well. Of course, it's a, uh, as Matt says, it's a very compelling subject off the bat to say, oh, by the way, um, I'm here because of this tragedy and trying to figure out how best to take care of it and uh, going into understanding a culture through language. I think there's a little bit in the beginning that's a little confusing. It kind of seems like a dog is involved, but uh, that's the only part that I think is a little uh, confusing about that page, uh, and that would have to do with whatever had come before page 112. So yeah, now I'll move on to page 112 in Far To Go by Alison Pick. Mr. Goldstein had been orthodox, practicing. The Bowers were assimilated, secular. Pavel shook his head. Those distinctions don't matter anymore, he said. What do you mean, don't matter anymore? Pavel drew on his pipe. Marta found the smell familiar, comforting. There was something almost sweet about it, like the cookies ready to come out of the oven. I mean just what I say, said Pavel. Things have changed. The Germans only care if you're Jewish. It's black and white in their minds. Really? Annalise asked. How is that possible? We couldn't be more different if... But Pavel didn't answer. He'd been looking at the silver candlesticks in the middle of the table. He now lifted his face toward his wife. I'm proud to be a Jew, he declared. Marta shrunk back, waiting for Annalise's answer, but she was silent. I didn't realize it, Pavel said, until now, until all of this. He moved his eyes in the direction of the window. The drapes were closed tightly. Behind them, someone had taken the old tailor's body away. Proud, darling? Marta could see Pavel searching around for what he was feeling, discovering it in himself as he spoke it aloud. It makes me... I've always been so proud to be Shek, to be a... Vlastineki. It's like I'd forgotten this other... He cleared his throat. This thing that has happened to Goldstein, he said. It's changed me. I hope it's not you next. What I mean is, I'm starting to know our own value as a people. Okay, so uh, I, I don't think it takes much to infer that uh, this is during the Holocaust, <laughs> seeming to take place in the Czech Republic, um, and uh, these characters are debating uh, the, the meaning of Judaism uh, first based off of uh, how the Germans are seeing it as a racial thing and not a religious thing, and that is um, encouraging Pavel, I guess, to assess his own identity. It, I would infer that he felt relatively secular and now he's not feeling so secular because the language is rather uh, on the nose about him going through a personal transformation in the moment. There are some uh, references to what could be um, acts of uh, 
violence. I mean, just going off of assumptions. I mean, the windows are closed against a body that was taken away. That could have been some uh, anti-Jewish violence. Something happened to a man named Goldstein. So uh, this is relatively uh, straightforward uh, in terms of uh, Holocaust fiction, but it has to do with uh, Jewish identity, and that's something that uh, really appeals to me. I mean, obviously there's a part of uh, Jews in the Holocaust that is about uh, victimization, but there's also, you know, the identity question about who are you. And I always love uh, when people start to uh, reassess what their Judaism means to them. So yeah, I mean, the truth is I was uh, intrigued by both of these books. I mean, it's not that difficult. I put them on my list because I'm intrigued by Jewish-themed fiction. But I think I'm going to go with this one, This Is All I Love and Know by Judith Frank. I've talked in the past about uh, being oversaturated a bit by Holocaust fiction, and this is something a bit different for me personally. I mean, uh, I I've read a lot of uh, Israeli fiction and some that's touched upon uh, terrorist acts that have uh, touched Israeli citizens, but uh, in particular this will have something to do with um, with um, an interfaith American gay relationship and how that uh, uh, goes into this. I guess I'll just read from the, the flap. <laughs> For years, Matthew Green and Daniel Rosen have enjoyed a contented domestic life in Northampton, Massachusetts. Opposites in many ways, they have grown together and made their relationship work. But when they learn that Daniel's twin brother and sister-in-law have been killed in a Jerusalem bombing, their lives are suddenly, utterly transformed. The deceased couple have left behind two young children, and their shocked and grieving families must decide who will raise six-year-old Gal and baby Noam. When it becomes clear that Daniel's brother and sister-in-law had wanted Matt and Daniel to be the children's guardians, the two men find themselves confronted by challenges that strike at the heart of their relationship. What is Matt's place in an extended family that does not completely accept him or the commitment that he and Daniel have made? How do Daniel's complex feelings about Israel and this act of terror affect his ability to recover from his brother's death? And what kind of parents can these two men be, really be to children who have lost so much? The impact of this instant new family has on Matt, Daniel, and their relationship is subtle and heartbreaking, yet not without glimmers of hope. They must learn to reinvent and redefine their bond in profound, sometimes painful ways. How does a family become strong enough to stay together and endure when its very basis has drastically changed? And are there limits to honesty or commitment or love? So yeah, I think the flap really uh, talks, uh, alludes to the fact that there is a lot going on in this book. There's a lot having to do with uh, personal identity and uh, relationships to Israel and Judaism and to... Uh, family and to uh, schisms about uh, homosexuality and how that's accepted within the family and uh, parenthood and uh, grief and, and and it's a long book it's like uh, what is this it's like a uh, 420 pages long so I, it's giving a lot of time to deal with this stuff which is, which is exciting and the only thing that I don't love about a 420 page book is you know more to read <laughs> I just wish I could stay home all day and just read but alas <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, I think I'm going to sign off for now. Thanks so much for sticking with me, especially for my page 112 tag, my first page 112 tag, as it were. Uh, I hope I made the, the right choice, the best choice, and I hope it was of interest to you. I will try to do more of these throughout the year. Uh, happy reading, everyone, and I'll see you next time.